The Monks of Tiberim is the topic uh, of uh, this evening's Cassisiacum Dialogue, and the author of The Monks of Tiberim is John Kaiser, to whom John's articles have appeared in the Foreign Policy Magazine, the Harvard Business Review, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, Cistercian Studies Quarterly, and other places. His books include Communist Entrepreneurs, Unknown Innovators in the Global Economy, and Stefan Zweig, Death of a Modern Man. More recently, John published, to great acclaim, Commander of the Faithful, The Life and Times of Amir Abdel Qadr, A Story of True Jihad. His, The Monks of Tiberin, Faith, Love, and Terror in Algeria, which won the French Siloe Prize, is the subject of this evening's discussion. It is, without doubt, one of the outstanding contributions to Christian Muslim understanding ever made. The leitmotif of John's telling of the story of the monks of Tiberine is that it shows that genuine understanding is always mutual, in that we only understand ourselves by understanding others, and we only understand others by understanding ourselves. Thus, for the first time in the history of the Cassisicum Dialogues at Marymount College, we have a guest. And what a guest. John has told us that he prefers to be not a guest speaker, but a guest fly on the wall. Our task is to entice him to give up his role as fly on the wall and to take on his Socratic role as gadfly, one who challenges our most basic assumptions about who we are and how we understand others, especially those who are significantly different from ourselves. And at this point, we'd like to turn to the story. I'd like to give John the opportunity to spend about 10 to 15 minutes telling the story of the monks of Tiberin. And after that, then, we would like to have a discussion uh, essentially driven by the questions uh, from the audience. All right, I thank you now. Good evening. Thank you, George. Um, well, you got me not only as a fly on the wall, but as a fly in the middle of the wall. <clears throat> so uh, I guess I, I, I can't uh, I can't hide, and I have to tell you uh, more than I had originally planned. <clears throat> but um, I might just uh, draw a, a connection between my. Uh, technology career and these books that seem to have absolutely nothing to do with Soviet technology, American technology, or anybody's technology. And actually it gets down to what do we mean by technology? Now, of course, in the everyday sense of the word, when we're talking, when we're talking about technology, we tend to think of technical things, you know, computers, electronics, cars, engines, you know, stuff that you get patented, inventions. But 15 years of working with uh, industry, mainly with the R&D departments of industry, and having many interesting conversations and observations of my own, I came to the conclusion that technology is actually not things per se, but the knowledge of how to make things, how to do things. Then. <coughs> Technology, I think, can be stretched to be given a new meaning. And the new meaning that I gave it as a result of my 15 years was that technology, the technology that ultimately really counts in an organization, in a school, in, in, in life, is the know-how. That's another word for technology, know-how. The know-how for getting along with people the know-how for living together in a community. Whether that community is a sales team in a business, a faculty in a university, a family, a church parish, wherever you want to accomplish something in conjunction with other people, there are some people, we all know from experience, who are better at leading, motivating, getting along, with other people, managing and working conflict, than others. And this isn't something that just kind of drops out of the air. Some people may intuitively have a better sense of that than others. 
but it's also something that can be learned and imitated. And the revelation came very clearly to me one day when I was talking to one of our clients about this very subject. And he said, you know, he was an aluminum company. They had smelters. There was lots all over the United States. In fact, it was Kaiser Aluminum, but not my family, unfortunately. Um, anyway, he so, said, you know, we have nine smelters in this country, and the most advanced one is in West Virginia, and the least, oldest, most obsolete one in, uh, in the United States is in Washington. Uh, which one do you think is the more efficient one? And I said, well, obviously, you know, the, the modern one. Wrong. It was the least productive of all of our plants. Why could that be the case? The modern, fancy, brand new, automated plant was the least productive. Well, I went to business school and I was supposed to know the answer to this question. But in business school, they didn't teach us much about human relations or the human element in business? The answer was blindingly simple and obvious. The reason why the modern plant was so unproductive was that the workers were on strike all the time. It doesn't make any difference how many robots you got. If nobody's there to push the buttons and flip the switches, you ain't got anything. And why was that? Well, it's a culture conflict. It was a human relations problem. The manager, who happened to be from Boston, uh, was down there trying to work with West Virginia Mountain Boys. And that's kind of a different culture. And for whatever reasons, they didn't communicate. They couldn't get along. He couldn't motivate. And they were on strike all the time. So what, you know, what did that say to me? He said, well, maybe the real issue in life, the real matter, the real thing that matters is how we treat other people. We see it all around us today. General Motors, it's a mess. They're the most modern robots, but they're making long cars. We weren't listening to their customers. We weren't listening to their dealers. We weren't listening to their workers. So, this is a book about technology. The technology of living together with people. People who are different, people who are similar. Of course, everybody's different. If all of you had to live together in the same house for the rest of your life, you would realize how different you all are and how hard it is to live with other people, even if they're the same color, same religion, same sex, you name it. Living together ain't easy. And monastic life, in a way, is a sort of microcosm of all life. Because who are monks? monks? Monks aren't people with any special degree. They haven't been ordained. Trappist monks are people who have decided they want to serve God in a special communal way. And that is to live in a cloister all of their life with essentially the same group of people. You may add, may subtract, but it's called the vow of stability. You stay here. You don't leave. You're married. You're married. Get along. Imagine being in a nuclear submarine your whole life. That's what being a monk is like, except that it's a lot prettier than being in a nuclear submarine. Monks would have been good real estate agents. They really pick beautiful places to build their monasteries. Um, so monks are people who want to love God by learning to love their brother and to love their brother in community, to practice brotherly love every day, working out problems in service to God. So, what a book about? There's sort of three storylines here. The setting, the setting is Algeria post-1962. Uh, those of you who may not have up to date on your modern history, in 1962, Algeria became independent from France. It had been an integral part of France since 1848. An integral part that was ambiguously integral because the Muslim French, 
the French Muslims were quite French. They were French nationals, but not French citizens. So they didn't have the same voting rights, not the same other rights. So they were kind of compromised French citizens. And much of the history of Algeria since 1962 is in part a legacy of French colonialism, French contempt for Arabs, Islam, and the whole culture which they had come to raise up, civilize, modernize, and improve. Um, the story has three threads. One thread is that of the leader of this community of monks, a young man by the name of Christian de Cherget, the son of an aristocratic French family with a tradition of producing generals, artillerists, cavalrymen. He was one of six sons, two sisters, but of all the sons, he was the only one in his family who seemed to have from almost from birth a special calling to serve God. He had a deeply devout Catholic mother. His father was kind of an agnostic humanist. Couldn't imagine why people want to fight over, you know, over the nature of God. God is God, has different names, but must not kill each other over, you know, who's God who's got a better name than the other one or why my way of loving God is better than your way of loving God. So he was kind of a, a humanistic, agnostic skeptic vis-a-vis -vis religion. But it, his mother was deeply Catholic and deeply respectful, respectful of Arabs, who, like Christians, prayed every day to the one God, the same God the Christians served. That is what she taught her son. Um, he was brilliant, brilliant in his studies, um, had a deep sense of calling, had to serve in the Algerian War, 1960, which he did as a civilian and working in the civil, civil affairs section of the army. And he had a traumatic experience that changed his life and changed the direction of his calling. And that traumatic experience was when he was out walking around with one of his Muslim friends, talking about their faith and belief in God, and the Muslim wondering why Frenchmen didn't, didn't pray more, and why how can you love God if you don't pray, and these sort of things. For the French, talking about God was very difficult to do in France, but in Algeria, they felt liberated because France is very secular. They don't talk about God. It's private stuff. It's embarrassing. But not in a Muslim country. So anyway, they're having this walk and talk, and all of a sudden, some of the insurgents come out of the woodwork and uh, actually the rocks and say, um, you know, we want to kill this Frenchman. And the French went to Rafalat. His Muslim friend, Mohammed, um, intervenes. As, he's a godly Frenchman. He's a friend of Muslims. He's my friend. Don't do him any harm. The Falagas, which is what the French call these folks, the Fells, left. The next day, Christian found out that Mohammed's that had been slit, and that he now had ten fatherless children. And this sign of sacrificial love by a Muslim made him change his vocation from being prospectively a parish priest in Paris, or maybe a future bishop, as his father and parents hoped, and to return to Algeria and serve God in Algeria. So one thread of the story is his service in Algeria, his injection into a community of older Trappist monks, pre-Vatican II Trappists, who still pretty much 
clung to the old ways of thinking about Christianity, triumphant, exclusionist, and here was this young, bright, Arab-speaking, somewhat uh, uh, suspiciously uh, overly interested in Islam and, and, and telling his brothers about the, the, the spiritual wonders of Islam. So <clears throat> there's this story of the tension between Christian and his community. There's a story which is also a story of the tension of his, whether he could actually maintain his, his, his vocation in this community of brothers where none of the brothers really shared his interest and fascination with Islam uh, and, and, and integrating his spirituality with his own Christian faith. And then there's the story of the community itself. Trappists don't live alone. They're not uh, theoretical mathematicians. They're not hermits. They live in a community. So there's a communal story, uh, and it's the story of how this community of monks, which was sort of, as one of them described it, like a tossed salad, bowl of tossed salad, where they would had a succession of superiors coming from, from uh, France who didn't really know what the mission of this monast strange monastery should be in, in, in post-independence Algeria and a predominantly some country with very few Christians left, and you know, why are we here? And so there was a lot of instability and doubt about what the, what the purpose of this community was. And over time, Christian de Cherge won the confidence of the brothers and gave it a sense of mission, which was to learn to seek God and, and, and Muslims and share in their spiritual riches just as they could share in the spiritual riches of the, the monks. And over time, a genuine love developed between the monks and their Muslim neighbors in a very conservative part of uh, Algeria in the mountains south of Algiers, um, and an area that was ultimately became a hotbed of uh, the Islamist insurgency of the 1990s. You know, they were helicopters dropping napalm and smoke bombs all around the monastery. They were in the middle of a hot zone. Yet the monastery and the area immediately around it was an oasis of peace and love that was never touched by the terrorists. And then thirdly, so there's a story of Christian's own um, journey, the story of the community of nine brothers and how they came together and followed Christian's leadership and then there's the story of the political chaos that engulfed Algeria in the 1990s, um, a kind of precursor to what we have experienced in Iraq. Almost all of the things that have happened in Iraq happened in Algeria in the 1990s, with the exception of suicide bombing. Um, if you were an employee of the government, if you were a foreigner, uh, you were uh, considered to be a friend of the government and therefore an enemy to the insurgents who wanted to get rid of a government that they viewed as a neo-colonial leftover from the bad days in which all of the government documents were in French and if you wanted to get a job you had to be French and you had to essentially be uh, a sort of uh, semi-Frenchman to work in any job that paid well and for many of the poor Algerians this was insulting and an indication that the colonial mentality you know, was still around and needed to be uh, completely rejected. And um, ultimately, these threads come together uh, as the Civil War chaos sort of heats up in the 90s and ultimately descends on the monks who are kidnapped and ultimately found that only their heads were ever recovered. And it's still a mystery exactly as to what and why and how. Uh, there are questions, but um, if you want the answers, you have to read the book. <laughs> Thank you.
at this point, uh, we'd like to shift even the geography here, and um, I'd like to ask John, you know, to maybe take a chair here, come up here, you sit next to him, I'll bring the microphone down, and uh, we'd invite Q&A, and uh, we hope that people who have questions can step forward to the microphone, because the acoustics here aren't really sometimes that good. So we can get this down to, uh, yeah. George, you have to do some talking too now. Remember? <laughs> So, you know, uh, we, we um, it's, the floor is open, and we especially encourage uh, inquiries from students, please. And, and please don't think that some question is too simple to be asked, right? That's the mistake that a lot of students in my classes make, oh, I embarrass myself to ask a question like that. It turns out everybody in the room wanted to ask that question. Want some water, George? Archbishop of Algeria, Algiers, right? Who um, kept encouraging the brothers in the prophetic dimension of their vocation to risk, to risk life, um, <coughs> living the good news as they understood it, living justice and peace, expressed as solidarity with the Muslim peoples who depend upon them. All the wrestling that goes on. One of the more dramatic moments in the story is uh, Christmas Eve, 1994. Uh, dusk, getting ready for, uh, what is this, what is the office at dusk? Is that the uh, best set? Uh, and uh, all of a sudden, um, six mujahideen spring over the walls of the monastery. They each sort of have different assignments. And one goes to the hotellerie or the guest house. All Trappist monasteries have guest houses. I guess all monasteries don't have guest houses which are for the wayfarer, anyone of goodwill. And uh, the lead uh, man in this uh, group of uh, Jadin comes uh, to the hotelery, and there are a couple people in there, a Nigerian student and a priest from Medea, town nearby. They say, uh, who's, the, uh, who's the pope in this place? Bring me the pope. Le Pape de la Maison. And, uh, you know, then, well, you must mean uh, Christian de Cherche. Well, go get him. You know. So, um, everybody goes off into the cloister and uh, says to Christian, Christian, there's somebody here who wants to see you. <laughs> and he's got, uh, he's got a gun. And uh, you better hurry. Christian says, I'm just sure I'm not in any rush. He walks slowly over to the hotelerie, which is outside the cloister, but inside the old walled enclave. And there's Saya Atia, a uh, sort of Department of Transportation worker at one time, bearded, barbu, you know, bandolier, knife. Kalashnikov, 
And um, he says to a Christian, I have demands. Christian says, I want to, I want to talk to you about some things we need. And Christian says, uh, well, not here, not in the hotelery. You've got to put your gun down. My faith and your faith both have the same law, which is you don't want to bring weapons into houses of prayer. So if you want to talk to me, we're going to have to go outside. So I have to take it back. There's an armed monk telling him to put his gun down. So they go outside, and, and they have this little toe-to-toe. Matthias says, um, we need money. We need your doctor. One of the monks was a doctor. We want him to come and take care of our wounded. And we need something else now. I can't remember the third thing. But he had these demands. And Christian says, um, well, you can't have any money. We don't have any money. We're poor. We live a life of poverty, taking a vow of poverty. We have a clinic here. Your men can come to the clinic anytime, but not here. Brother Luke is staying here. He's old, he's asthmatic, he's got phlebitis. He's not going into the mountains with you. Now, Tia, and Christian says, by the way, this is the night we're celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. And Atiyah apologizes. Says, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. Christian then says, um, you can bring your men to the dispensary. We heal all who come. And Atia says, at one point, you know, we don't consider you religious as foreigners. You are believers. But I will send back my representative to discuss these matters. He leaves with his six men, or five men. And after that, um, Christian gathers together the, his brothers. I think there were seven or nine at the time. And they're, of course, all terrified. And they all voted immediately to get, get out of town. Because only a month earlier, 20 Croat engineers who were working on a hydraulic project in the valley below had all been murdered by the Mujahideen. So they knew these people were serious and could easily kill them. Christian, whose whole kind of calling was devoted to serving in Algeria, was of course very upset at this precipitous decision. He called Bishop Tessier to come on up and talk to the monks. Now, Tessier, an Arabist, is a bishop. He's the head of the church in Algeria, de facto, very learned man, very committed to the church's presence in Algeria, overseeing, I don't know, three or four hundred priests and nuns at the time were still were in Algeria. But this was a time when other Christians were being, you know, clerics, ecclesiastics, religious were being killed, along with lots of non-religious. It wasn't as if the religious people were being singled out. In fact, there are far fewer of them being killed than just regular, ordinary consultants. And what, you know. Anyway, Tessier comes up and has a chat soul searching with the monks and basically says several things. He says, you know, if you leave precipitously, 
you will spook the rest of the Christians and they're going to want to leave too if you just bug out. So if you are going to leave, at least do it gradually. But consider this. Consider what your vows mean. You've taken a vow of poverty, stability, charity. Think about your relationship with your neighbors. And what kind of poverty are you having sharing with your neighbors? If you can get out of your little boat and go somewhere, and they can't, you'll never be able to come back. kind of poverty is that? And yours is elective. Their insecurity is no less than the monks. So, there's this little discussion. And then Christian, after the bishop goes back, basically says to all the brothers, he says, uh, why don't you all go sleep on this? Think about it. And we'll talk tomorrow. And as he called each brother into his office the next day to find out what they had, the results of their reflections, everyone had basically the same response. And that was, I am not at peace with the decision to leave. So from that point on, for the next, every six months, the monks would gather together and evaluate their situation. And they decided, because of the bonds that they had with the community, where they would go to their birthdays, funerals, uh, they would provide various kinds of help, uh, uh, material, and psychological, spiritual, to their neighbors. Their neighbors would often help them with various things. Um, they had this bond. and. Uh, They decided that as long as the neighbors didn't ask them to leave because they thought they were a threat by being there, when in fact it was the opposite. Their being there was actually kind of a protection because Muslims, particularly hold monks and priests uh, in a high position of respect, as explicitly said in the Quran. And if we don't get any direct threat, if we don't get a little midnight note saying, you know, get out of here, we're going to kill you. And that was usually the way the Mujahideen, and still is, the way they operate. They're very polite. They inform you before they kill you. So you have a choice to stay or go. Well, the monks never got a note saying, you better leave. They're going to kill you. And they never got asked by their neighbors to leave. So they stayed on and on, despite the Catholic Vatican, despite the president of France, despite the local Wali, all saying, leave, 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 because it's dangerous. And um, they collectively agreed to stay, renewing their commitment every six months. And one, uh, one of the monks, Christophe, the Breton, he described in his diary quite, I thought, simply and aptly, you know, what this was going all about. He said, you know, our love here with our neighbors is maternal. Our relationship is one of maternal love. We don't want to leave our family, our children, I guess you could even say. And so, anyway, so they stayed on as things got more and more dangerous despite, you know, all the obvious threats. And it was always a choice. And, and that was why whenever different communities of Christians were killed, like the, the Père Blancs, the White Fathers, a couple of years earlier, and the Augustinian sisters, um, at all the funerals, they always said the same thing. They said, these lives were not taken. The Mujahideen did not take their lives. It was not a victory for the Mujahideen. They gave their lives. They knowingly and willingly gave their lives to God 
and to Algeria, because that's what they wanted to do. They all knew that they could die, just like soldiers going off to Afghanistan know that by going there, they can be killed. So these were Christian soldiers in the best sense of the word. They were doing what they viewed to be their duty to God and to their friends, who were all our basically Muslims. Uh, I think Lynn and then Mary and then uh, <laughs> from the book or from going over to a Muslim country? Both. Both. Yeah. Well, I think from the book, I mean, the one message is simply to recognize the truth of what a, a Muslim in Morocco told me, actually, when I was doing some research there. And then we got talking about Islam. He said, you know, there's as many Islams as there are couscous. <laughs> and you could say the same thing about Christianity. You know, if somebody said, well, tell me what Christianity is. Wouldn't you have to say, well, no, wait a minute, well, which one, you know? Uh, conservative Catholicism, liberal Catholicism, evangelical, Pentecostal, Mormon, are they really Christians anyway, those Mormons? Uh, you know, uh, Pen Presbyterian, which? Baptist, Northern Baptist, Southern Baptist, conservative Southern Baptist, liberal Southern Baptist? Which, which Christians are you talking about? It's an idiotic question, basically. So, it's, and, and, it's, and to talk about Islam, it, 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 in any, in any sort of aggregate sense, is equally idiotic. It doesn't exist. You ask a Jew, you know, well, tell me about Judaism. Well, which Judaism? Which Jewish? What's, you know, there are many Judaisms. What's an American? Well, there are many Americans. I mean, so part of the problem we have in, in dealing with that part of the world, I think, is a problem we have in, in, in the lack of vocabulary, a lack of nuance in, it, in our language. And, and it, this doesn't apply only to the Muslims. I think it applies to the way we talk about ourselves, about banking, like all bankers are now terrible people. Or, you know, it's, it's sort of ridiculous. And, and uh, I don't know why... We'll make an exception. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, particularly your banker. Right? <laughs> but uh, I think it's sort of, uh, I guess, a laziness in part. You know, it's just... Uh, so I think the thing, one thing to remember is there are many different faces of Islam, and many of those faces are, are presented in this book, from the most frightening, fanatical of, uh, you know, a, 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 a Jesuit who tells me of a friend, of once a, man, a young man who was once a friend of his who got radicalized so badly that they came home and he told his sister to wear a veil and she wouldn't, he threw gasoline on her and set her on fire. To Sufis and, and, and monks that are, other monks who, the Mohammeds who gave their lives for a French soldier. And to just remember that uh, um, everybody's different. Every Muslim, every Christian, and, uh, and it's very, it's a great disservice to yourself and to uh, any society when you lapse into, as I do, as we all tend to do, uh, into these kind of, you know, Islam is this, Muslims are this way, Algeria is that way. I mean, it's, it's just a tremendous diversity in and, and this story and among Christians. Uh, and this story kind of, I think, underlines that, 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 that diversity. Um, I guess, uh, you know, there are other things you can take away from that. That would be one that I would, because I, would, uh, I think you all probably have images and preconceptions uh, that you've developed if you haven't been over there. 
And uh, you know, every time I go to Algeria, people are like, "Were you safe? Was it okay? Uh, were you afraid?" And I, you know, I had to. <laughs> the only thing I was ever afraid of when I went to Algeria the first time in 1999, after things had cooled down, was being driven by a mad Frenchman up to the up to the monastery who drove at 115 miles an hour, and with talk the whole time, you know, burning <laughs> up. So that was that was my most frightening experience, actually. Um, and uh, but. Uh, what I particularly noted in Algeria was the frequency with which, um, you know, you saw New York police, NYPD, baseball caps, and all kinds of little logos, American little things, you know, which doesn't mean you can, don't want to put too much significance into all that, but there, I, there's very little uh, hostility towards Americans as Americans. Uh, they all hate what our policies are in the Middle East, but. Uh, uh, the only thing, you know, that I would advise and, and is, is when you're in any country, if there are certain places that uh, the locals say it's better to avoid, and follow their advice. And that's about it, you know. What, uh, what, uh, I think what Arabs, well, I, I won't go there. But anyway, I, I would say, uh, I would say, uh, uh, don't go over there being afraid, because fear is something people smell. And if you walk around and look in the room, somebody's going to stab me in the back. You know, you just, you just be relaxed and, if, and uh, enjoy yourself, because you're probably a lot safer there than you would be visiting a lot of big cities in this country. Uh, Mary. Um, oh, I like those. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I was, I was just, um, I think my ears perked up when you said that they were doing it for God and for their community. Um, first of all, how do they know what God would like them to do? And second of all, um, I don't quite agree with their decision to give up their life, um, you know, to risk so much. Just, just to preserve this relationship with this Muslim people. I'm not sure it is necessary for them to put themselves at that level of risk because I'm sure that there must be other sustainable and less drastic ways of, um, you know, of you know, having that relationship, you know, that sort of growth in between the Christians and the Muslims. Besides, you know, what use are you if you're dead? Well, that's an argument that uh, a lot of Frenchmen often made as well. Uh, but let me start with your first question. Actually, one of the reasons I wrote the book, or I got into the book, was I wanted to understand precisely that. What does it mean to serve God? How do you know when you're serving God? And, uh, and not serving yourself. I mean, that's always, you know, am I serving God or am I serving my own ego? Well, uh, and, and uh, imagine it. It's a little tricky sometimes <laughs> sorting those out. But that's one of the reasons why you have community. When you live in a community, you have checks and balances. But I would say you start with the Word. If you're going to serve God, you better start by reading God's Word. You read Scripture. You read Scripture. And then you read scripture some more and you assimilate what scripture enjoins you to do and how you behave. And what ultimately, if you're a Christian, it boils down to a very simple formula. Love your neighbor. And treat others as you would want to be treated. That is the essence of Jesus' message along with, you know, love God, love your neighbor. And if you can't do both, start by loving your neighbor. Because the best way to love God is to love God's creatures. And of course, the most difficult to love of all God's creatures are humanoids. But, uh, you know, so, so the idea of practicing brotherly love as a way to love God is the ultimate form of service. Yes, there are all these rules that help orient the believer, whether you're a Catholic, a Protestant, a Jew, Muslim, Christian, you know, all religions sort of have it's like the Marine Corps, you know, there are certain rules and procedures, if you will, that help keeping you, you're sort of reminding that 
you have a, a higher authority that you trying to live accountable to. Have you ever said the Lord's Prayer? You've said the Lord's Prayer? Yeah. yeah, well, do you remember what it says in the very beginning? Yeah. Our Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That means to love, live according to his will. Well, what is his will? Well, again, it's not, it's not always evident. And, and, but I think one evidence is what are the fruits of your action? I think there's some, I'm sure there's a, a verse or two in the, in the, in the Bible where you, you shall know them by their fruits. Fruit or the, you know, a, a, a healthy tree bears good fruit, a malevolent tree, a bad tree bears rotten fruit, right? So you, you, you have different indices. A, there's the word itself. Are you, are you following the word? Are you, you know, are you committing adultery? Are you being envious of your neighbor? Are you doing certain things that clearly violate some of the prescriptions? So are you violating things? And then are you following a certain spirit? I mean, the Bible, it's very simple on that, you know, do unto others, treat other people as you want to be treated. I mean, that's the most basic, I think, divine ordinance that you don't have to even be particularly religious or religious at all to see that there's a certain common sense to that, you know? I'll treat, I want to be treated, you know, the same way. Yeah, I have a follow-up question to that. You were saying love your neighbors, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I misunderstand. I mean, actually, somebody, I forget who it was, uh, I heard say, you know, actually, you shouldn't love your neighbor as, as you would want them to love you. Because some people have queer ideas about how they want to be loved. You should actually love, uh, you should actually love your neighbor as they would like to be loved. And in a way, that allows for cultural differences. If, 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 if uh, loving your, being polite, uh, to your neighbor and as a woman is to kiss them gently on the cheek and you say hello, say in your France, that would be a normal thing to do. But if you do that in some countries, that's highly insulting. So you could say, but it, what it boils down to though is to be respectful of the other and part of respect is to knowing how other people expect to be treated and to recognize that there are cultural differences and what you do at home isn't necessarily always appropriate somewhere else. But neighbor, but I had a problem with love your neighbor for a long time. And I, when I had a, a relationship, uh, a spiritual relationship with a priest in France, I said to him one day, I said, you know, what is this love your neighbor stuff? Why, why the hell should I love my neighbor? I have trouble loving my own family and my friends, <laughs> the people I'm supposed to love. So what is this? He said, you don't understand. Love, in the Christian sense of the word, has nothing to do with a sentiment. It has nothing to do with emotion or Roman romance. It has to do with respect. It has to do with patience. It has to do with goodwill. What is a better thing that you can show, a more loving way to treat a stranger than to wish them the best? To show goodwill. To be just and fair to people. So justice, goodwill, I mean, even businesses understand that. I mean, goodwill is something they put on a balance sheet. It has a value. So, um, so love your neighbor doesn't mean, doesn't mean being romantically involved or necessarily loving them the way you love your children, or your wife, or your spouse. It means respecting the dignity of the other, wherever they are. It's easier for the monks because they're away from their neighbors. No, they're not. That's the whole point. That, that, no, that's uh, actually the whole point. They are living very closely to their neighbors. Uh, and their neighbor may be uneducated, may be black, he might be white, he might be American. Who knows? I mean, you can be stuck with a very interesting mix of people who aren't necessarily compatible, but if they're joined by a common desire to love God and to be godly in their behavior, then they will make an effort to try to overcome their personal passions, prejudices, peeves, and, and you know, things that make relationships go wrong. 
We'll, uh, we'll come back, I'm sure, because I think that Steve here has a follow-up question, but you've been waiting for a long time, yes? Please, what's your name? What's your Olivia? Olivia? Yes, please. I have a question about your book. Why did you decide to tell three stories instead of just one main story? Because they're all interrelated. They're really, you know, the, they're interconnected because the, the, Christian's story is is uh, is not isolated. It's, it's 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 his personal struggle that is lived out with brothers who don't really agree with him initially, or are kind of turned off by his Islamophilia and, and uh, his aggressive uh, proselytizing about Islam. Even though he wasn't trying to convert anybody, he was trying to educate, but it was viewed as proselytizing. And that the whole story of the monks is sort of meaningless if it's not presented in, in the historical and contextual environment of, of the country and what was going on there. So I don't think the story would have been meaningful uh, without binding them together. Unless you're, you know, unless you're a Catholic and you're really just into a devotional book, and there have been, there were some books that were written about the monks who were very devotional and just about how wonderful these sweet, wonderful monks were and how courageous yeah. they were, and there wasn't a sort of, you know, a, a contextual framework and, and I so I just thought if I want people to read this book who maybe don't give a damn about monks but they're interested in Algeria or terrorism and what's going on in this Muslim Western conflict that we're living with, you know. So it just didn't make sense to me to try to isolate one thread. Uh, Steve? Thank you. Yeah, so, that, that was a great question. Too. There's, there's so much to, to, to think about here. It's a fascinating story. I was taking with question. And hearing the answer um, leads me to want to ask you to maybe develop a couple of the terms you use. At one point you mentioned part of the value of living in a community is that uh, even though people have to share a certain common bond, there's, there's lots of individuals uh, and they're all very different even in the monastic community. But nonetheless, there's a sense of common purpose and mission that can bind diverse people together. And in a way, that could be a, a force for great good. But at the same time, uh, uh, the checks and balances that you mentioned that keep people honest, so to speak, uh, are not always there. Because I would think in certain situations, that common bond that often can become a cause for great good can also become a cause for great evil. Because people in a group can often convince one another of the rectitude of their own enthusiasms. And sometimes, as we know, uh, those enthusiasms then merge into fanaticism of one kind or another, as, as Voltaire once, once explained, that the danger is when enthusiasm moves into fanaticism. You can have a passionate belief, uh, you can dislike someone because of that person's race or religion, uh, but when you then act upon it, that's when you have a problem. So my question for you is, uh, where do you think things went wrong in this multi-tiered situation where you have all these different lives that come together? Diverse people who nonetheless share common bonds, but uh, have trouble living together. Now this is a, it's a big question, it's a difficult question, but in your experience thinking through this issue, which is paradigmatic for so many other issues uh, in the world today, what do you think is the force that leads that common bond sometimes to cross over from a force of good that binds people of diverse background together into a force of evil that tears them apart? Are you asking a question specifically with respect to the religious communities? Well, or I think broadly? specifically with respect to the community that you discuss in your book and then any larger uh, ramifications that you might see that we can learn from. Well, I don't think the community of monks was torn apart. In fact, they became closer, uh, so there was no rippage there. In fact, you know, they, they became more s s s the solidarity of the monks uh, increased under under the pressure of of, uh, of, of of their of the fear and their willingness to sacrifice themselves. Um, and I'll get back to your question about that too. Um, so it, the, your the question applies more, in a way, to the different groups of Muslims. And there were some Muslims who were very much like Christian, who 
refused to condone certain behaviors of other Muslims and gave their lives for it. They were killed because they refused to legitimize uh, behavior that they considered have no basis in Islam. I think I think I think Benedict pretty much got it myself. Uh, you know, as to why what you're talking about happens, and he, you know, he he uh, he describes uh, different categories of monks. He puts them in four categories: the, the uh, uh, monks who live in community, the monks who live in as hermits. Uh, monks who live in small groups and wander around, he called them the Giro Vogs. They were just sort of moochers and they didn't really, you know, they were, they were really kind of phonies, uh, but they were taking advantage of the hospitality of other monks. And then he talks about Sarabites. And I don't know, does anyone know the origin of that term, Sarabites? S-A-R-I-B-I-T-E-S. I've -I -E -I never kind of quite got a handle on that. But the Sarabites are monks who, as he says, insult their tonsors because they go around saying that the, the, the go, go around basically cherry picking scripture and, and, and saying that this, uh, the things the thing that they want to do saying this is holy and, and condemning the things saying this is prohibited and just essentially doing selective picking of scripture which everybody does too to some degree or another. Uh, so kind of fraudulent reading of, 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 of text to manipulate it to, to support what you want to do. And the other and, the other, and probably more dangerous uh, uh, sin to, uh, that he warned his monks about uh, and all Benedictines, and Trappists are just one branch of the Benedictine order, is he warns them of the zeal of bitterness. The zeal of bitterness which leads them, separates them from God and leads them to hell. And zeal of bitterness, as we all know, is, you know, what is it? Anger, hatred, desire for revenge. And if you look at violence anywhere, whether it's in the name of religion or whatever, psychopathic violence, it's, it's, it's invariably there's anger, hatred, bitterness in the mix, the fuel. So if you if you if you if you're angry, and then you've got the Bible out here, and you say, I, okay, I'm really angry, and I want to kill a bunch of people who I think are bad people for whatever reasons, uh, I, I bet I can find uh, some stuff in this book that'll legitimize that, and that that happens all the time. And a lot of people will agree with it. Huh? That's okay. Yeah, and then there, are, and that's right, and there be and yeah, and, and those people, and, 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 and there may be others who, because they're either dishonest or untutored or just, you know, being misled by leaders, but they have some legitimate grievance, which, you know, all these guys who were fighting the government felt they had legitimate reasons. I mean, and they, they did on some level. In fact, some of the monks were rather sympathetic to the GIA, as they were to the FLN during the, uh, during the French War. I mean, the, the monks didn't have their fields burned. The other colons had their fields burned. Uh, so, um, yeah, you can, when you get a collection of people who are angry, bitter, and you have a leader that they look up to who's willing to mislead, essentially, uh, although, you know, what is misleading? You know, where the Catholic uh, liberation, uh, you know, commandos uh, in the middle, of, were they, I don't know, what, what's the position, what was the position on, on uh, Catholic uh, priests, uh, you know, uh, leading revolutions in Mexico? It was not it was condemned. It was never. Did anybody? He's the famous thing where he gets off the tarmac in, in, uh, in, uh, and he points it in Nicaragua and he's pointing to everything that just so cut it out and he puts it in the revolutionary government. And he's pulling it out. So there's never. This whole passing of 35 years of replacing all of the liberation of bishops. The bishops went out losing Latin America to fund them this credit by the Catholics. So there's never, there's never been any attempt to justify. Uh, men of the cloth uh, uh, carrying weapons in, in anger? No, I mean, it was... It was um, or, or using weapons in anger, it, I guess you say. It was received as uh, uh, counter violence, but the other says it's not that church people um, leading revolutionary activity were just simply being violent, they were being counter violence. And in the 18 years of Pope Paul, the six months, it was an understanding that the direness of the situation of the 
violation of the elemental justice of peace of, as it is the peace of people was such that even violence might be justified. But starting with the pontificate of John Paul and continuing with Benedict, even more so, they saw it to, uh, to dismantle the richness of liberation and his perspectives on the meaning of the gospel with material justice and peace in his life. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to comment, uh, going back to some of the things you said, why some communities go wrong, some communities go straight. But I think uh, John's already touched on it, uh, incidentally. And first of all, you can always go back to scripture. You've got love God, love thy neighbor as thyself. And then I think submission to God, what does that mean? It really means an emptying out. It means totally suppressing your ego. And just as John said, am I doing this for God or am I doing it for myself? I think if you think about that, you'll find that the people who go wrong are really letting their ego interfere or their sense of zeal. Uh, John hasn't mentioned one thing that he does mention in other talks, and that's his whole Islamic uh, conception of jihad. And jihad really means a fight for self-control, uh, <clears throat> a fight to control your own ego, your own desires. And then, of course, as in Christianity and Islam and in Judaism, the idea is to submit yourself to the Supreme Being. You, are you, are you know anything about, are you, are you Christian? Sort of Christian, Christian light, Christian? I'm agnostic. You're agnostic. Uh, can, I, can I just comment on what he said? To submit oneself to a higher being. Don't you think it's egotistical to say that you know what the higher being is? Do I, no, I don't. Yeah, I, I think, John, you, go you, ahead. Uh, yeah, you yeah, urged yeah. me far earlier on to speak up more, oh, and I've really been letting you carry the burden. And uh, I, that, that's, a, that's a real difficult question because um, in a sense, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, in the final analysis, all are forms of what, from a philosophical standpoint, we academic philosophers at least refer to as, um, they, they, they endorse a form of the, theological voluntarism when it comes to ethics. In other words, and, and John, I think, rightly pointed out to the crucial line in Christianity, thy will be done. Inshallah, I don't know what it is in Judaism, but I mean, it has to be something similar. And I think the question that you raise is the Socratic question about all forms of theological voluntarism. Before I can do the will of God or submit to the will of God, I have to know the will of God. How do I know the will of God? That's the question of the euthyphro, right? And, and this is very difficult. I mean, even pop culture understands this at a gut level. I don't know how many here have seen the movie Monster with Charlize Theron playing the role of Eileen Warnos. So, do you realize that in the middle of the movie, uh, how many heard in the middle of the movie where she says, who the F knows what God wants? It, th this is the question, and uh, it struck me that that, that uh, smack dab in the middle of that monstrous movie about a monstrous figure is this question. But you know, even Kant would say, I think, the common, ordinary human understanding grasps what the difficulty is there. So it's like, it's not enough, I think, from a philosophical standpoint to say, well, you know the will of God by reading the meaning of the scripture, because that's actually question begging, right? That assumes that we know that the scripture is from God, whose very will is in question. So it, it's like, you know, you get into this, yes, you get into a circle, and the question then becomes, is it a vicious circle? Um, do I know that the Bible is true? Well, I would know that if I knew that God is good, but how do we know that God is good? Well, he is good if the Bible is true, but is the Bible true and is God good? These are extraordinarily difficult questions. And, and by the way, and it's to John's credit that he doesn't sweep any of this under the carpet in the book because smash smack dab in the middle of the book, practically ge geographically, is the tragic story too of Sheikh Mohammed Buslamani. Yeah. Uh, the GIA, and then it, 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 it proves once again that, um, and it's something that is underappreciated in the West, I think, that the main victims of Islamic terrorism have always been Muslims, right? I mean, that, that when you say that, say, oh, come on, you know, think about 9-11, oh, well, okay, look. The GIA is looking for a fatwa. They want to find a sheikh or an imam or a mullah that will uh, basically rubber stamp or give them a blank check to carry out the kind of war that they want to carry out. It started in 1989 and going into the early 90s when you know, they want to throw over the FLN 
that government that's so Frenchified and Francoified, and they want to, you know, install this Islamic Salvation Front, but it's a radical form of that too, right? They're, they're even distinct from that. So they're searching for an imam or holy man, a learned scholar of the Quran, who will sign that. They can they will put out a fatwa on uh, innocent civilians. You can then kill innocent civilians. They can't find one. So they kidnap one after another, and one of the most prominent ones, they, they just get frustrated in and they kill him, right? They slit his throat because he won't sign that they can't wage the kind of war that they want to wage, right? And I think that's a perfect example of the kind of egoism that you've, you know, they're going to twist and turn the scripture any which way to make it suit their purposes, right? right? So, now, now that's an extreme case, and that's why I think it's self-evident. But the harder cases are the ones where, you know, it's like not so clear, right? They're not so extreme. What, what do we do then, right? That's, so it's like, um, I think actually it's not strange at all that this question has now come up like a red thread running through several questions. So it's something that is, I mean, it's been around well, since before Socrates. In, so. If you don't believe in a creator, then, you know, it's a particularly relevant question, but you, in a way you're sort of disqualifying because you're basically rejecting the whole notion of revelation, uh, 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 at least in the monotheistic tradition. Uh, so, you know, if you sort of reject that, 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 that tradition, then, yeah. If you believe that there is a creator and you happen to believe uh, that your creator uh, is, you know, you know, it's Allah, it's Yahweh, it's uh, God uh, manifested, you know, uh, to manifest himself in the human form. Whatever, whatever, whatever uh, particular um, uh, pathway you decide to follow to bind yourself to God, and that's what religion means. Religio means to tie back, to tie yourself to God, to hold fast to God. A religious person is one who is committed to a relationship with God, and they believe in the existence of God as a given. So I mean, it's not like it's not. So if you start with that as a given, then uh, you know, then you say, well, how do I allow? How do I live a life that would be pleasing in, the God, in God's eyes? God's eyes or, you know, not God as a person, but in the spirit that you think is represented by this higher power that we call by many different names, uh, the power that gives us physics. It gives us the laws of gravity, Newtonian laws. You know, Newton, uh, uh, Einstein was once asked, you know, does he believe in God? Einstein said, my God is all the laws of physics. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because I don't believe myself God is a micromanager deciding who's going to get cancer, who's going to get hit, who's going to get by a car, who's going to marry whom. No, I don't think he's, I think he's, he's a very good marketeer, though. He understands that you've got to say the word different ways in different times and different places. You know, he's, He's, you know, corporations understand that. God understands it, that you don't just say it once. You gotta say it many times. You say it different ways, different times. Uh, so, but, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, relate to God? Well, you've got these different traditions. You know, there's the Christian tradition, there's the Jewish tradition, there's the Hindu tradition. And, and, I, and I think those traditions serve as a compass. Not only how to relate to God, but to how to guide your life, how to live a well-guided life. We all know we need guides in life, you know, like your parents, your coach, your teacher, friend down the street, you know, whoever. But, you know, we all need guides. I think most of us do. Have to be God. No, it doesn't have to be God. It can be anybody who uh, is wise enough to put you on a good path. I mean, that's what it's ultimately about. Let's bring Casey in because I think that you, it's to this. Is the, the guy in the sky, the white hair, 
on the right skirt, and yours is the wrong skirt, and then we'd have to fight it. If we could find a way to transcend the pettiness that is implied in that, and really understand that we really are all looking for the same thing, then we might be able to make some progress along these lines. But we don't seem able to do that. We seem to be mired in our, in our mm -hmm. very narrow interpretations of the problem. If I may, I think that, um, um, uh, and John points this out in the book, uh, in a problem, I spot. And it's not an answer to what you said, Casey, but it's um, just a reaction that Christiane Marie, uh, the prior of the, um, uh, of the monastery for the last, I think, 12 years of its existence, he was fond of saying that um, people, especially people of different opinions and different views, um, probably would be well advised not to have conversations like this. <laughs> because he, he, he had this deep-seated intuition that, uh, you know, that deep down there are differences there and actually talking about them, is, it, it makes them worse uh, because they're irreducible. Now, that doesn't mean they're bad. Um, uh, what it does mean is that, uh, he, he, what he does think is that uh, it's better for people to just get along. And it, not in a superficial sense, help one another serve one another, love one another, and not to go into, you know, whether, I mean, you, you know, even within Christianity, you know, in, 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 there were Balkan wars in the 14, 1500s, people were slaying each other by thousands because some insisted that you had to make the sign of the cross with three fingers and others said with just two, because, of, I mean, you know, history is full of examples like this, even within, even, or think of, you know, Shia and Sunni Islam, or, or in other words, so, so you know, his deep-seated intuition was a healthy one, like, and, it, and, the, and it's actually the motto of this evening's Kassasikim dialogue, uh, to bring forth our common humanity amidst our differences. Um, I, I don't think he was advocating that we forget our differences, or that, I just think he thought that we, we run up against a wall at some point. Go beyond uh, and, 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 yeah, we, we have to, like, we have to transcend them, but, but they're going to be there. They're going to be irreducible, but we can't let them be determinative of outcomes, right? We, we have so many other things to do um, in this life. And, you know, again, it's not really an answer, but, uh, but, uh, but and again, and there's a philosophical side of me that says, gee, I love these kinds of questions. But then there's another side of me that says, you know, like, I mean, basically, if I tell my students in class that, you know, the Jews, they don't take their main prophet, Moses, and make him God. Uh, the uh, Muslims don't take their chief prophet or their, you know, their prophet, Mohammed. They don't make him God. It's the Christians who are different. They take Jesus and they made him God. And this was a decision made, you know, 325 years, basically. Didn't into make him God, he was God. Well, I know. Well, that's what, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> so there we go again. No, okay, but, right? But, you know, See, yeah. So in other words, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it's like, you know, it, it's, it, when, when you get right down to it, you know, we, you know we, 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 it, it, these kinds of theological questions, they're really going to be irreducible in the end. And Christiane Marie is saying, look, we can still get along. And it's not that Rodney King question, like, can't we all just get along? You know, it's not, it's not at that level. This is a deeply profound thought about how to live together in this life till we get to the other side and then, and then yeah. God will sort us out. <laughs> He'll sort us out. It's a reference for silence. In other words, it's not surprising that a monk, not surprising that a healthy yeah. monk yeah. would yeah. think that yeah. the it's, way to go below yeah. the, the, the dogmary of the anthropomorphic God yeah. is to engage one another in silence. It's Wittgensteinian, practically. That of which we cannot speak thereof, we must be silent, yeah, really. Well, yeah. Rick Warren, I thought, sums it up with a little phrase that he has. It's kind of, you know, he it's, you know, it's, you know, just because we don't see eye to eye doesn't mean we can't walk hand in hand. I mean, I mean, that's really the simplest and way, most profound way of putting it. I mean, think of everybody in this room. I mean, I'm sure there are intractable things you, some of you don't agree with each other on, of an intellectual nature. But if with a little effort you can get along, if you don't focus on that particular issue, whatever that might be, you know, gay marriage or whatever, and you just, you know, say, you know, okay, we don't agree on that, but we can still work together and do stuff. Just leave uh -huh. that well alone. Richard, 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 been waiting. I think one part of answering the question of should the monks have stayed around yeah. 
might be might be found uh, in looking at what the reaction of the Algerian public was to their having been killed. What was the reaction of the Algerian public? Was, well, that yeah. Saying. Well, that, that's. A, I'm glad you you brought that back because I wanted to continue that that uh, follow up on that question. Well, the, the reaction of, uh, of, the pub, of the public was, was just overwhelmingly emotional and, and sympathetic. And, and, and think about this. Here's a Muslim, aside, I'll just read you excerpts from a couple of letters that, that, that were sent to Bishop Tessier afterwards. Uh, but here also you, you had these seven insignificant Christian Trappist monks honored with a state, state funeral by the Algerian government in June of 1996. Motorcycle, yeah. L, uh, escorts, clearing the streets, guards everywhere. But here, it's a Muslim country honoring simple monks with a state funeral. How many you know, Christian societies have honored, you know, I'm not that there's a parallel there to be found, but anyway, it's very impressive to me. Uh, but on a, on, a, on a lower level, uh, you had uh, just a flood of letters coming into, um, into the bishop's uh, uh, house in Algiers, and uh, I will just uh, read you one or two uh, because I find them very moving. Uh, I can find them now. Uh, yeah. Um, this was from a female doctor, actually. Does not God test those he loves? Wrote another. No matter what has happened, we truly love you. You are part of us. We have failed in our duty to protect you, to love you, to love you enough. Forgive us. Your place is with us. Don't listen to the Pharisees. You must accomplish your divine mission with us. I believe it is God's plan. Um, we must water, this is another writer, we must water the seeds bequeathed by our monks, our monks. Our duty is to pursue peace, love God, and respect people who are different. This woman told Bishop Tessier she kept a copy of Christian's Testament pinned to the wall of the living room for a whole family to remember. And today, uh, 10, 15, 15, 12 years later, the the Muslims uh, who used to work for the work with the monks, associates, they still look after their, their grave sites. There's a tremendous uh, affection, and if, if you know, if a person's life is sort of uh, memorialized by the memories and feelings people have of them after they die, then I would say the monks did not die in vain. But I think you know there were people who did argue, and some actually are the family members of the monks who were sort of angry at, at Tessier for. Uh, you know, making these arguments that caused them to reconsider their decision to, to flee immediately. Uh, but, you know, it was their decision, and they were grown-ups, and they had made a commitment to stay at their posts. As long as those two events didn't happen, they didn't get a threatening letter, and they were asked to leave. To me, uh, it's an admirable commitment to one's calling, and it's like you know, being a soldier. Joe, Joe. Last word. Last word. Oh, well, that was the same word I was going to say. <laughs> um, no, let me go back. John and I were reading uh, this whole question of the monks who we stay, who we not stay, who we go. What I kept hearing was Luther's, here I stand, here I stay. And at a certain point in George's vicious circle or some religious circle or whatever it is, I think the journey of faith, you get to a point where you have to. I don't think you can remain in suspended skepticism. I don't think that's healthy. Whatever the decision is, you can make the decision. But the presumption I've been hearing among people's questions is that once you make that decision, all ambiguity leaves uh, and life is easy from there on. And that's not the mind's experience, that when you make an act of will, the ambiguity the, the questions deepen, and contrary to Freud's entire superstructure of psychoanalysis, faith is an act of courage, and that's what the monks, for me, symbolize. Yes. That it was not a happy ending. <laughs> you know, it's 
Well, I remember Jean Paul, Jean Pierre saying, you know, uh, how uh, at night, you know, during the day, you know, when they were working and busy, you know, the, 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 the dark cloud of fear would sort of recede. But at night, these people, you know, worried a lot. Uh, and they, and, and, yeah, I, 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 I understand what you're saying because they were making commitments, but they were tentative. They were six months. Every six months, we're going to check again. Are we still okay with where we are? And, uh, and uh, you know, they were willing to apparently, you know, give themselves the, uh, you know, the, the go ahead to continue each, each of those six-month intervals. And,